Now, this doesn't just happen in circles. Sometimes a wound is just going to be too big and your skin is not going to be able to grow to cover it in a timely fashion, certainly not fast enough to avoid infection and ulceration. What to do? Kelsus has a solution for this and here he's recommending this as a way to remove brands and tattoos. Now, you, this may strike you as a horrible way to remove the tattoo because it's going to leave a really obvious scar. Yeah, it, the last step, step five, we've taken a square and turned it into this long thing. But the reason why you're removing tattoos and scars is because a regular way that enslaved people were marked as such was through branding and tattoos. So being able to remove a tattoo or scar tissue was important for access to a decent livable life in the ancient world. Because if you had visible scars from a beating, even after you had gained your freedom by whatever means, this could be used as a way to keep you from being treated as a citizen in good standing. The idea is that if you were beaten while enslaved, it certainly must be your fault and it must have meant that you're a bad slave and therefore not trustworthy. This is, I don't think I need to really explain why that is messed up. <clears throat> if you had um, attempted to leave your situation of enslavement and been captured in the act, uh, then branding would be used to mark you as a, a runaway. This is also something that you may want to have removed from yourself if you then make a second successful attempt to escape. I hope that works. And this is why I think it's kind of cool that Kelsus gives us how-to directions for fixing this problem so that, yeah, you have a funky scar, but it could be from anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be a tattoo. Now, the way he's done this is by rearranging the missing skin in such a way that it's going to heal a little bit better and then creating stretching in the epidermis so as to cover the uncovered area better. In section two, he trims the edges of the wounds so they're less rounded. They're going to heal better. Also, you don't want to suture skin that was cut too long ago. Once skin has begun to heal, you can't suture it because it's already formed a lip, so it's not going to attach. Uh, this is why sometimes if you've gone in with a wound and it's been more than 24 hours, your doctor will say, you know, no, I can't suture this now. That's why. If it's stopped bleeding and it's behaving pretty well, you probably don't need the suture anyway. But if you do, your doctor will often trim the edge so that it will create a new fresh edge to come together and heal. Here, what our surgeon is doing is cutting these long channels this way and this way in figure three. Um, this is freeing up the skin beneath. So you're both cutting on the edge and then you're flaying the skin up a little bit. We call that dissecting the skin up so that it can move and stretch. And then you're stretching the free skin in number four so that it covers all of the area. And if it's a really wide gap, then you cut these kind of moon-shaped areas that I'm showing you here on number four. And that relieves the pressure a little bit. So the skin will stretch as you pull it. And then on the edges, it'll gap a little bit. It'll leave these kind of moon-shaped marks. But they're much smaller than you had originally in the center square because the skin has stretched as skin does and then as it heals the stretching will settle in and it'll heal into these linear scars that could be from anything which is pretty neat actually I, i'm i'm so pleased that this procedure exists because gosh darn it it makes me happy that people manage to get away from abusive asshole enslavers. It's warm fuzzy. Another complication, we mentioned this earlier, bleeding. Wounds bleed. Wounds have cut blood vessels. 
cut blood vessels bleed, especially arteries. I mentioned earlier that there are some ways to intervene in this process, and here are some of them. These are taken from Galen, but Kelsus mentions them as well. So method number one, you just use your finger, you apply pressure with your finger, and this is if you're in a really fast situation where you have to like find it and grab it. Your hands are your best feeling apparatus, and uh, Although they don't have great hand washing practices in the Mediterranean because soap isn't in wide use. And while that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's horribly, horribly dirty, soap is great because it breaks down mechanically the walls of all kinds of pathogens. So without washing your hands with soap, hands are going to be a bad idea. But if someone's bleeding to death, maybe you're willing to take that risk. If it's a hard to find blood vessel. The hand can be the fastest way to get at it. Uh, maybe it will comfort you to know that Galen often went from hand to like tying off and then would remove the section that he had just been touching in order to create a, a clean tie off. And then if you tie off the blood vessel, so say as in Illustration number three, you're putting a surgeon's knot in a noose around the blood vessel and then tying it off. That section of the blood vessel that you've now damaged by grabbing it with pliers or your hands, uh, blood is not flowing back up into it because you've blocked the flow of blood. So even if there is some bacteria there, it's not going right into the bloodstream. It may fester in the immediate wound area, but if you're culturing beneficial pus, then you might be okay. Um, yeah, I know, I know. This is bad modern practice, but we have to give the ancients a little bit of leeway, Jimmy. He's a judgy baby, isn't he? I have no idea where you get that from. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to say? Um, the arterial hook is being demonstrated in two, so you can see what that looks like. Um, this is great if you want to temporarily stop the bleeding and then try to reattach the blood vessel later. Uh, vascular surgery doesn't get underway in any real sense in the ancient world, but Galen does try to make it happen on occasion. Finally, you have the cauterization process where a piece of pitch, sometimes with a little bit of lead in it, like that recipe from pharmacy, the, the black paste of, um, what was it, Diogenes? And it's being applied with that olivary spatula probe. So you're keeping your hands out of it. You're using heat and tar to seal off the end of the blood vessel. You know, this isn't a horrible idea. Just for larger blood vessels, this may cause bleeding problems later. So this is a small blood vessel only thing. Uh, they didn't just use pitch for this, by the way. You'd also use alum salt. Alum salt very, very quickly dries out the tissue of the blood vessel and sterilizes. So it's a great choice. Stings like a sun gun, but it'll, it'll work. Uh, this is, again, rubbing salt in an open wound. Next up, wound dressing and care. I've mentioned these before, but here's kind of an overview. We've talked about wound washing. Wound washing is big in antiquity and it's a regular part of wound care. This is a good news item. Most of the things they're using are good ideas and often they've been heated. So there's a, an accidental reduction in the risk of secondary infection coming off of these substances used to wash the wound uh, because they have been boiled and cooked or uh, heated up pretty darn hot before they're applied. Um, wounds left in the open air aren't necessarily in a bad situation. Sometimes that's going to cause the least amount of irritation. It's going to let you watch the wound and see how it's doing, especially if you're washing it and caring for it a couple times a day. This is still sometimes our solution for dealing with a complicated wound. But if you've got a fresh wound with clean margins and you're really sure that you've washed it properly, suturing is an option. And suturing is something that was used in the ancient world, really close to the way we suture today, even down to the stitches. Um, 
needle and linen or silk thread, sometimes gut, but usually linen and silk. I've mentioned dry antiseptics or enhemes. Uh, there are all kinds of substances can, that can be used here, and I'm not going to enumerate all of them. Just suffice to say, you've got options here. Uh, another way that you can go about doing this is turning your bandage into a, a constant antiseptic delivery system. And again, they don't know that's what they're doing, but that's effectively what they're doing. Linen, because it allows liquids to perfuse through its layers really well, but it's also quite absorbent, and it also doesn't tend to hold particulates, it's a great choice for bandaging. It acts to physically hold the wound together even without sutures. The, the pressure from a tighter linen, linen bandage can control bleeding. It also keeps the wound from getting contaminated by uh, dust and soot and everything else that's flying around in the ancient world. And keep in mind, animal poop is in the dust and human poop. It's a lot of poop. So no poop in the wound is good. And you can achieve that effect. Um, leaves, sponges, often ivy leaves, which is an interesting choice because ivy leaves do have some chemicals in them that are still under investigation for chemotherapeutic effects in cancer treatment. So maybe, I don't think you're gonna cure cancer with ivy though, please don't try, but you know, it's out there. You need a taco. I think you need a taco. Yeah. <sighs> the baby needs a taco. I think it's dinner time. We'll pick this up in a minute. The baby has had tacos. The situation is promising. Let's talk more about wound care. Now, I talked in the previous slide about using sponges as a way to keep liquid preparations oh. on wounds oh. as they oh. heal. Keeping wounds moist also helps with wound outcomes. And fart noises? Really? <sighs> um, the same principle w works also with wool. Um, you've seen poultice recipes before. This is something we don't do anymore. And, you know, I'm not sure if it's not something we should try to bring back. So a poultice uses some kind of fiber to hold liquid or liquid D. Uh, no, Kato. Although... Let me introduce you to my cryptid. This is Cato. He never shows up for lectures. Hey, no baby. Hi. What is your opinion on cabbage? He loves it. Okay. <clears throat> That's Cato's butt. There it went. <sighs> dignity. <Yeah>. Dignity. <clears throat> right, yes. Uh, what was I talking about? Linen plaids, vinegar pads, vinegar soak. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Spouse is taking the fart machine. We should at least introduce him since he wants to be a All right. <laughs> yep. Say hello to the to the students. This is our tiny taco monster. Yep. That's Mr. Spouse. I exist. I am not a figment of her imagination. Mm-hmm. Feel honored. You've seen Mr. Spouse and Cato in the same lecture. I don't think any of my classes have seen both Mr. Spouse and Mr. Baby and Cato. Lucky you. All right. What were we talking about? Um... Yes, 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 yes. Vinegar pads. Dun, dun, dun. Um, yes. So sometimes poultices will be applied directly to wounds, and sometimes they're used around wounds to stop the progress of infection. Um, that's rare, though. If you're interested in the details of how this works, it's in Kelsey's book six. I have you reading seven and eight, but book six is on the internet too. In fact, all of Kelsey's is on the internet, both in Latin and English translation. So to find out more, read more. All right, guys, the eyeball stuff's coming. So uh, 
Look away if you just want to hear this bit. I'll tell you when you can look again. I told you. I mentioned couching needles back when I was taking you on a tour of surgical instrumentation. Uh, this is what we mean by couching. This is an old school method for treating cataracts. Now, it doesn't give you good vision, but it does give you light dark sensitivity because a cataract happens when filmy material builds up on the surface of the lens. So the lens is a structure inside the eyeball. Um, let me use my red thing. So this here, that's the lens. Um, this is a rigid structure inside your eyeball. Um, your eye is a series of membranes that's filled with um, a body fluid called the vitreous humor. The vitreous humor keeps your eyeball tense and it allows the structures inside to float inside that, that fluid. But stuff can get into that fluid over time. It can build up on the structures, including the lens. And the lens is exactly what it sounds like. It's a transparent tissue that focuses light and allows you to see images crisply. And if this gets cloudy, it's a little bit like um, having a, a grease smear on your glasses. First it makes it blurry, and then if it's like mayonnaise, you can't see through it, eventually you lose your sight. Now, if it gets to a point where there's so much buildup that you can't distinguish light and dark very well, then you can lose your vision completely. In the ancient world, the go-to procedure for correcting this level of cataract blindness was the couching procedure. You would diagnose a cataract by looking into the eye. You can see through the, the black part of the eye, the pupil. Um, it's not actually black. It just looks black because you're looking in to the deep structures of the eye. This is why when you go to the optometrist or the ophthalmologist to have your eye examined, they'll medicate your eye to dilate so they can see as much inside past your iris, the colored tissue that helps you adjust for light and dark and focus. Uh, it gets it out of the way so they can see the internal structures of your eyeball. In someone with cataracts, that black spot is going to be cloudy and it'll reflect light back. It looks kind of milky and cloudy. Um, so in order to treat this, you would go in through the juncture where the iris meets the whites of the eyes. So um, right where your eyeball kind of bulges out a little bit. So you go in through that space trying not to disturb the muscles of the iris itself. And then you would use the needle to knock the lens off of its mooring. So the lens is held in place by little fibers that just keep it upright behind your pupil. And the cataract needle knocks it back into the vitreous humor. And you wanna push it down there real good so it stays out of the way. If it floats back up into place, you just have the cataract back again. Now. This doesn't give you a new lens. In modern cataract surgery, they remove the old lens completely and put in an artificial one so that you can still see we've gotten better. This would, however, give you light dark sensitivity. You couldn't focus, but you wouldn't be running into walls as much either. This would give you some function. So it's not a, a horrible treatment for cataracts as ancient surgeries go. And it's relatively low risk, especially with bronze instruments. And this is one of the most common surgical specialties we see popping up in the ancient world. We're looking at a range of couching needles from antiquity. Uh, they're a little worse for wear, but you can get the idea. Idea. Oh, that, sorry. I, I felt bad just as I was saying it. Uh, they're ridged so that your hands can grip really well, because you do not want your hand to slip in the middle of this. Um, sometimes different drugs were used to try to paralyze the eyeball, <laughs> including um, henbane and more alarmingly, wolfsbane. Don't with the wolfsbane, but it, it, henbane could do okay. It's also got a bit of a narcotic effect. So there is some 
pain relief available for this, but you have to be awake for it. Even today, you still have to be awake for cataract surgery. So the, the surgeon is going to have to have nerves of steel to get in there, and then the patient is going to have to sit really, really, really still. It may comfort you to know that this is would have been done on people whose cataracts were quite severe, so likely they couldn't see the needle coming. That actually does make me feel better. I don't know about you guys, though, so sorry. However, there is a one better option in antiquity to the classic couching procedure. And I say classic because this was the standard for 3,000 plus years in cultures independent of the Mediterranean. We see it in ancient China and in India. It might have been done in Mesoamerica too. This is one of the early hacks that humans figured out for fixing their vision. This is a reproduction from a couching needle set that was found in modern day France. And the ones that we're looking at are not the one on the top. So I'm gonna use red now for this one. That one is a standard couching needle reproduction. This set on the bottom is a placement guide and um, a hollow needle. So the placement guide, this one right here, is placed inside the hole of the middle needle. Oh, that, that's just a terrible arrow, but you get the point. Okay, it goes in there. And they fit together. And this is the technological advance, is someone has to be good enough at bronze casting to make one needle that fits inside a hollow needle. This is as close, by the way, as we get to hypodermic syringes in the ancient world, too. Now, once they're put together, the guide inside the hollow needle sticks a little bit out through the tip here. That's placed inside the eye onto the surface of the lens. And then the, the surgeon very gently, very carefully moves the end of the needle, which isn't very sharp, it's a little bit blunt, across the surface of the lens very gently, taking care not to dislodge it from its connecting tendons. And then once they've lifted the filmy matter that's sitting inside the curve of the lens, uh, they then remove the inside needle. So this here green needle is pulled out, leaving you with just the hollow needle in place. And then very carefully, very gently, you'd put your lips onto the hollow and then suck a little bit. And that would create just enough vacuum to suck up the filmy material that you had dislodged and remove it from the eye. Now you're gonna remove some vitreous fluid too, but the vitreous fluid will rebalance in time as it heals. So that's just gonna be a temporary loss in intraocular pressure. But if you are very careful and know exactly what you're doing, you would be able to remove the cataract without removing the lens, which means that you're not just restoring light dark vision, you're restoring vision. The person will be able to focus as well as that lens allows them. You know, there might be some gunk left behind, but essentially you can clean a cataract out of an eyeball without destroying the structures of the eye. Beginning, and this seems to date from the first century CE. So yeah, once we get into the High Roman Empire, if you're in the right place with somebody who knows what they're doing, you might be able to have functional and effective cataract surgical procedures. And it's pretty darn spiffy keen. Uh, like I said, this is kind of a good news lecture. This is one of a sequence of illustrations that I've included just for funsies. This is from a medieval manuscript of Celsus with illustrations. And it's one of my favorite things, so indulge me as I share this with you. This is the medieval monk's illustration of the cataract procedure in which the patient is just way too chilled out. 
and the physician does not seem to be trying hard enough to stabilize the needle. I mean, he's just sticking it in there and it looks like a wizard's wand and... Ugh. I think that could have been handled better. Yay! The eyeball stuff's done. Let's drill a hole in a skull. From the eye to the skull, let's talk about trepanation. I mentioned earlier that boring holes in people's skulls seems to be one of these surgical procedures that humans do as soon as they figure out that they can do it. We see this in Neanderthal skulls. So this is a very, very old procedure. And interestingly for us, it seems to have been pretty survivable as ancient procedures go. I think the figure for Mediterranean skulls uh, in the ancient world with signs of healing on their trepanation holes is about 60%. And this holds true elsewhere, keeping in mind that in the ancient med, we're talking about a procedure that's mostly done to treat um, trauma as a, a way to relieve pressure after a blow to the skull, for instance, uh, or similar clinical problems. Like this isn't a situation where ancient doctors are going, ah, evil spirits, hole in skull. I say that because there are people who will claim that and they are, don't, they're making shit up and maligning ancient people, which I don't hold with. Like, if you're going to make fun of them, make fun of them for things they actually believe, is all I'm saying. Oh, hi, it's Tethys. Dang, you were just collecting all of my family members today. Okay. Now, we're looking at a variety of trepanation drills from the ancient world. And A, the one in the middle, is the fanciest. These are the two modes that were used... Um, in the period and the place we're talking about. There are other methods of accessing the skull. Um, sometimes you'll see cross-hatched cuts. Sometimes there's a scraping method where you slowly scrape at the skull. This is typical for the time period that we're hanging out in right now. You would either use a boring drill to drill a series of holes to perforate a circular area or an irregular area in the skull. Uh, this is from a, a modern skull that's been done as a demo. They used a flint pointed drill. It doesn't have to be flint pointed to do it this way, but we do find evidence of this kind of trepanation procedure in antiquity. Far more common though is the one we're looking at on the right. That is a trepanation with a modiolus. The modiolus is the circular saw that sits on the end of a rod. And this is that uh, circular saw that you use a bow to mechanically drive in order to <laughs> saw down into the skull. Now, we're not sawing into the brain here because the brain isn't the first thing you run into when you get through the skull. The brain is surrounded by a tough membrane called the dura mater, which is just Latin for the hard stuff. Medical terminology sounds really ridiculous if you speak Latin and Greek, just FYI. So uh, it goes skull, hard stuff, brain. And this is a procedure that's meant to remove a plate of the skull without perforating the dura mater. They did recognize that if the dura mater is perforated, you're going to have much poorer outcomes. It's much less survivable. In such cases, they recommend removing bone fragments, you know, trying to clean it out, but just having reasonable expectations. And that is correct. Um, once the dura mater is perforated, infections in the brain are almost inevitable. And if you imagine the surface of the brain, it's mushy and it's got a lot of cracks and crannies you can't like reach in there and wash it off. Uh, it's not a great situation for an unsterile environment. But if the dura mater stays in place, which it often does in head injuries because it's tough, like part of its job is that when something sharp bonks you in the skull, it resists perforation by the fragments of your skull. It's a great thing. 
thank you for existing, Durham Altair. Okay. In that case, your next problem that will develop, and this is why you shouldn't hit people in the head to incapacitate them, no matter how much Captain Kirk does it, is because you may not kill them by knocking them on the head and rendering them unconscious immediately. But when that happens, it means that you have hit the skull hard enough that either at the site of the hit, you have created an injury that presses on the brain in such a way as to render the person unconscious, or you create what's called a contra-coup injury, where on the side opposite of where you were hit, your brain slooshes into your skull, and your skull is a skull. Yeah, it's a confined area, and your brain is super gooey. Well, not gooey, but you know, it's squishy. So when it squish sloshes into the other side of your skull, it and the blood vessels feeding it, blood vessels tear, the brain gets bruised, swelling ensues, and it's the swelling that gets you. Because swelling puts pressure inside the skull, the skull which is already very crowded, yes, it's full of your brain and the dura mater and your blood vessels. There's a lot going on in there, hopefully. Once the swelling begins, your brain is rapidly going to run out of space and it's going to squish itself up against the surface of the skull, especially if you've got a bleed that's displacing brain matter. It'll squish your brain against your skull. It'll mess with circulation. It'll kill brain cells. And eventually you end up brain dead and then dead dead. It's very bad. It's like, seriously, don't concuss your enemies unless you really, really need to. And then like get the medical attention. Just saying. Uh, however, we can do something if it's too late and you've already um, thunked a Klingon in, in the brain. By removing a bit of the skull bone, you're creating space for the swelling to expand. If you do it over the injury site and there's bruising underneath, you also create drainage for the blood that's collected. Um, and the, the blood generally collects between the skull and the dura mater. So you can create drainage, um, you can allow space for expansion, and it, it doesn't take a lot. A little bit will let you survive the swelling process. The swelling will go down, you'll return to functioning, you'll be relatively okay. Uh, probably still have some brain damage, but it's better than nothing. Uh, this is still a procedure that we do, and modern trepanation looks essentially a lot like ancient trepanation down to the round skull and the, the bird drill. I'll be looking at that on the next page. Now, one thing to point out about illustration A, and this is something Kelsis talks about, you'll notice there's this pointy bit in the middle. That is removable. If you ever buy reproduction medical instruments and they haven't made that removable, they're doing it wrong. It hangs a little bit below the modiolus. So the modiolus is the round saw blade. The point is what helps the, the blade stick in the skull when you're first sawing. Because sawing on bone is difficult. Uh, bone is slippery and it's a little bendy, even your skull bone, which is quite hard. And in order to get your saw bot bit to, to drill in and bite, especially if it's round, you need to get the saw to stick and make sure that you're cutting on the same plane. If you've ever tried to saw wood, you know the struggle. The saw will jump and skitter until it's into a groove. Now, once it's in the groove, though, you have to be careful because you cannot pierce the dura mater. They're going to be three layers of skull. So there's the outer plate, there's the inside material of the skull, t the bone tissue that's going to be that um, living honeycombed kind of lighter structure, and then the inside surface of the skull again is smooth. Once you get to that inside surface, you have to stop, remove the inside pin so it doesn't pit your patient, and then carefully, carefully cut and stop the minute you're through the bone before you perforate the dura mater. That's the tricky part of this, and this is why I don't recommend you doing it on your roommate unless you've been to med school. And even then, like, get specific training. No, not even for extra credit. 
not even if they're really annoying you. So if we were in class, I'd ask you to comment on what's happening here, but we're not, so I'll just tell you. This is a skull fragment that shows two modiolus marks. There's a lighter dent on the inside and then one deeper next to it. This patient didn't make it. These are very crisp lines. The skull has not healed. Not only that, but they didn't manage to cut through the skull. It looks like they just got started and stopped. This patient was likely in the final stages of dying, probably having seizures and moving too much for the doctor to be able to get the saw in. Either that or something was going on making it difficult to operate and the modiolus has jumped a little bit. So here, the modiolus had trouble getting into the skull tissue in the first place, and then once they started cutting, the patient was gone, they stopped, it was too late, they're done. Um, a moment of silence for this poor, poor person. But also, I think this is telling about the kinds of situations in which this procedure was performed and just how tricky it is to do it. Another thing that I noticed looking at this bone, um, there's parotid hyperostosis around the area where the cut is being attempted and there's staining on the bone below it. See how it looks much darker there? Um, that's a sign of bone infection. This is likely a skull that had some kind of complex injury that had been going on for a while before they attempted the trepanation. This is it's not a good story. Oh, drat, I forgot to mention the slide before this one. Um, the one with the, the two trepanation holes in it, both of them looking nice and crisp and clean. Um, you'll also see this depression on one part of the skull. Yeah, that guy probably got hit in the face with a rock and I don't think he lived. But they tried valiantly. Two holes. All right, guys, I have a pet peeve that I kind of need to get off my chest here. Um, something you'll see in film renditions of trepanation is that after the hole has been drilled in the skull, the pressure is relieved, uh, someone will take like a silver going copper gold copper coin and like hammer it in over the hole this is incorrect before the 1600s um it's called cranioplasty and uh except in the case of a few egyptian manuscripts that are very very early and don't seem to represent a practice that was continued on into the classical period they aren't putting plates back over these holes in the head. Rather, the exposed dura mater right under the surface of the skin of the scalp um, heals a little bit harder and the person continues with their life. Um, exhibit A, which looks like pretty much all of the Roman skulls I've ever seen ever, Greek, Roman, like anything from the ancient Mediterranean that is not Bronze Age Egypt, right there. This is a healed trepanation, and nowhere can you see a plate. Um, th that's typical. And when plates are used, uh, the, the golden plate that gets mentioned in the Bronze Age Egyptian texts, they aren't nailing it. Think about it for a minute and you'll understand why. If you drive a nail through the skull and the nail goes in too far, you're going to create the thing that you just drilled a hole in a person's head to fix, an epidermal hematoma. Epidural, rather. God, I did that again. Epidural hematoma. I've gotten you a nice illustration right here. See? There it is. It's an epidural hematoma. Not a great choice of color, but on we go. If your nail is too long, you're going to end up with, worse, a subdural hematoma. And then you're just shit out of luck. Uh, so you're not going to be nailing a plate in place unless you know exactly how long the nail has to be. Uh, not just any nail will do. And then if you don't nail the plate, uh, it might slip underneath the surface of the skull. Uh, 
but not necessarily. If you curve it right, it should be okay. And if it's loose, it can also rise and fall with the swelling of the brain, so you're not recreating the problem that you went in there to fix. However, the evidence for Greek and Roman medical authors and everyone in their orbit, so here we're talking about Egypt from the uh, archaic period in like the, the 800s BCE on into the um, early medieval period in the 400s CE. Nobody's putting plates over the hole. The hole just stays naked. Now, Master Commander Far Side of the World, since it's in the early 1800s, I think, it's like, yeah, 1820s, 30s, that's okay. By then, they're putting plates in. However, I do raise a brow a little bit at the nail. Um, I hope Dr. Maturin knows what he's doing, because if those nails are too long, nobody's holding fast to anything. You'll understand if you've seen the movie. If you haven't, you should, because it's fantastic, and I love it. Second favorite movie. First favorite is Prince of Egypt. But at any rate, what I mean by all of this is that when you're recreating a trepanation scene, don't put a plate in because you think that there should be a metal plate covering up the hole. That is incorrect for any time before 1600s that isn't Bronze Age Egypt. Sorry, folks. Okay, let's continue with our regularly scheduled lecture. I just felt like this was important. On to our next bit of business. Uh, this is another good news thing, and something that I hope you haven't had to think about, namely jawbones. Easy to break, hard to set, because you use them a lot. They move. You can't talk without moving your jaw, and your jaw structurally is very vulnerable, especially to getting punched or hit with iron bars or smacked with a sword, and you've been around the ancient world long enough to know what's up. Yeah, they're kind of violent there. So figuring out a way to set a mandible was a priority and really important because people were regularly having their jaw broken in fights. We see a lot of evidence of this on skulls. It's, it's a thing. So somebody punches you in the face, your skull bone is broken. What do you do? Scipio, do you know the answer? That's right, the Heraclos jostling knot. Uh, this is mentioned in Celsus, including its inventor's name, a guy named Heraclos, who was um, a first century CE doctor, we think. And this is a way of combining two loops of strings into this complicated knot that goes over your chin. So the middle of the knot goes over your chin and then the loops snug themselves to hold the chin really closely into place. And then those four loops go where your where your face mask ties go now. You pull them around to the back of the head like this, and then you tie them in the back, and you can adjust the tension to fit your patient, and then keep adjusting it as they heal. But absent being able to wire somebody's jaws together, which isn't a thing in the ancient world, this is what you would do. This is how you would put a jaw in a sling, and then if they can keep their face immobile enough that can heal. So this is a huge step forward for medicine and really good news for all of the barroom brawlers in ancient Rome. There were considerable amounts. On to our next bit of coolness. This is taken from a written description in Hippocratic Fractures. This is one of the few examples that doesn't come from your Celsus reading. Instead, this is in Hippocratic Fractures. And it's our best guess based on the description. There are a couple other descriptions of this kind of cast elsewhere. So I mentioned earlier that there aren't plaster casts in the way that we make them today. So what would you do to set a long bone? If you remember from our first lecture, yeah, if you don't set a bone correctly, especially a long bone, it won't heal into a smooth plane. You'll end up instead with an overlap and a stricture keeping you from being able to rotate your arm correctly. 
similarly with the leg, you want to have the bones pulled straight, set end to end, so they'll heal right. But once you've done that, they're not going to stay. And if it's not an open fracture, you're not going to be able to glue it. And if it is an open fracture, even glue won't save you. Uh, open fractures are very difficult to keep uninfected. And the survival rate before antibiotics was not good at all at all. They tried sometimes, and there was a survival rate, just no good. So if you're in the ancient world, try not to externalize any of your bones. It's my best best advice there. Um, and like, I don't know, bring some um, Cipro. This is a way of creating a spring joint to apply tension to the leg to keep it stretched out and set. As part of what you want to do is continue the traction that you use to pull the bone into place to hold it there while it's healing. So what they've done is they've created a collar at the two swelling points, one at the ankle and one at the knee. These are made out of leather wrapped wood or just leather um, padded with horse hair, so it's got a lot of flex to it. The leather is going to give you a lot of traction on the skin. And then there are four green wood splints that have been set into sockets on either end. And then you tie ropes in the front and the back, and this um, bends the green wood so that it creates a spring effect that pushes the ankle piece and the knee piece away from each other. This creates mild tension that keeps the bone into line, and then the rigid structure of the sticks and the leather collars keeps the bone immobilized. Now you have to stay in bed, this isn't a walking around cast, but if you stay in bed for five to six weeks, and everything goes well, you can still have a functional leg by the end of things. This is something ancient medicine does really well, is closed bone fracture setting. They're also really good at uh, physical examination techniques. Orthopedics is a good news area for the history of medicine in general. So if you want your patients to live more often than not, orthopedics is a great specialty to spend time with in the ancient world. It's my favorite palate cleanser. On to this horrifying looking thing. Um, and it is kind of horrifying, but not really. So this is something that we don't have any archeological remains of. We only have descriptions. It's called the Hippocratic Bench because it's described in the Hippocratic Corpus. Let's see how this works. And it's a bench. Uh, not quite a bench for sitting on bench, though. Instead, this is a mechanical device meant to aid in traction for the setting of bones and for healing complicated fractures of the spine that require traction. So let's enter into the gnarly yet strangely optimistic world of traction devices in the 4th century BCE. And because this is Hippocratic, this is available, if you have a fancy doctor, for all of the periods we've been surveying. This is uh, after Littre, who was a 18th century, I think, doctor who did one of the earliest editions of the Hippocratic Corpus. And apparently he was into cubits. A cubit is the distance from the average person's elbow to their wrist. Um, for those of you who have Latin, cubitare is to lean on your forearm while you're lying down. So like a cubit is your leany part of your arm. So a cubit is about a foot long. So it's about like two, two and a half feet wide by seven-ish. Math isn't my thing. Please don't judge me. Now, the different crank windlasses on this are for attaching ropes and then cranking to apply traction. And then there's this set of um, channels in the side which would have been used to attach um, leverage points in order to add pulley systems, we think. Uh, again, I'm going to sound real vague because we have a lot of questions about this thing. Um, at the center, there's this 
third bar, which is detachable, as is that um, thing sticking up at point E. So you can use this either as a full-blown bench or as like half the bench. And that middle arm is used sometimes as an anchor point and also as a, a fulcrum. Here's one example of things you might do with a Hippocratic bench in a slightly different reconstruction. You'll notice we have a lot of questions about this one. And this is showing its use as a spinal traction device. So the patient has been tied with knees flexed uh, at the ankle and the knee and then below the arms. He's lying a little bit on his side, propped up with cushions, and then the uh, upright piece is being used to immobilize his lower back. By applying traction by cranking the windlasses, you stretch out the spine and you decompress any compression fractures and you also allow the vertebrae to heal in such a way that when you remove the traction the spinal cord will still be functional. This is freaking brilliant and it points to the early understanding that spinal cord injuries if treated carefully and in the right way could be mitigated it's an old idea. They figured that out early. By the time of Galen, they figured out that nerves branching out of the spinal column control sensation in remote body parts, so that even though the injury is on the spine, sometimes you feel it in your extremities. We likely have Herophilus of Alexandria to thank for that one and his living victims. <clears throat> oh, Herophilus. Nonetheless, this means that... Um, spinal traction is a thing and setting broken backs might be something you could expect in the ancient world but it means that you're going to have to lie still for a really long time on this super uncomfortable contraption and we've yet to find any i mean this doesn't necessarily mean they don't exist but they don't seem to have been super common like i think you'd have to be in a major urban center for someone's practice to include one of these things and you'd need to have enough social support to be in traction for that long so again access is the issue here not necessarily the existence of the technology much like our own world we can save a lot more lives than we actually do because money Now on to another suggestion for Hippocratic bench usage. Uh, this is from another author's reconstruction. Here, the upright is much higher, and we're not sure if this was an attachment you could add to a Hippocratic bench or just a fix that you could do with any standard chair. Uh, again, this illustration is somewhat modern. I think it's from the 1820s or thereabouts, uh, but it's good enough for our purposes here. And this is solving one of the main problems in orthopedics, namely, it takes a lot of physical strength to set bones and reset joints. You have to apply leverage in the right way, and you have to be very strong, but you also have to be very precise about how you apply that force. It's difficult. So one way that you can make it easier on yourself is by stabilizing your patients. They're not wiggling around and to use leverage and in some cases, pulley systems, too. Uh, Serranus mentions this a bit when he talks about um, interventions in routine but difficult birth, where like the birthing chair, in his account, some of them have uh, places for pulleys so that if you need to pull the baby out, you can create like this um, wind up extraction situation. <laughs> Uh, moving right back to popping shoulders into joint. This is one solution. They've immobilized the arm with a splint. They've got them over a chair, so the joint is isolated, the torso is supported, so all they have to do is use the humerus as a fulcrum to pop the shoulder back. Once you've done that, you immobilize it with a bandage, you wait for the muscle tissue to heal, and you hope that it stays in. Uh, even with modern technology, shoulder dislocations can re-dislocate. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. So try not to. But if you do get, get treatment, we can do a lot more orthopedic stuff now. On to the more horrifying end of Hippocratic bed usages. Um, 
I have so many questions about this illustrator's choices, including why the doctor is wearing armor. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Spouse snickered. Um, yay. Good, that joke landed. Um, this is a questionable tactic in body work and therapy that still shows up sometimes, namely having somebody step onto the spine to make the joints pop and realign. Um, even if you have a very small person doing this to you, this could go very, very poorly, very, very quickly. And a dude wearing armor is a bad life choice. Bad, bad life choice, ancient people. Um, Using protection. <laughs> no, not that kind of protection, honey. <laughs> Just don't. Please don't. But I had to share this image with you because, oh my God. <laughs> so this is the bar, folks, for your medical illustration project. Can you make more sense than a dude from the 1830s drawing a doctor in armor? Good luck. But also, like, where is that other tie going? Like, there's a rope around the butt, but then the doctor's kind of like, I have so many questions. And then there's these disembodied hands holding the levers. Um, I have concerns, and I'm just going to leave that there. And on to one of the worst in our catalog of somewhat bad ideas, uh, and this is mostly good ideas, but this one is stupid. I don't want you to come away with the impression that all ancient surgeries are good ideas. This one is very bad. It's another one from Kelsus, and here's that medieval manuscript again. Why is the doctor naked is a question that I really want answered. I mean, the patient I can kind of see a rationale for, but they're both naked. Why? At any rate, uh, the patient, as you notice, is tied to a ladder, which has been suspended from the ceiling on a pulley. And then the doctor is in the process of letting go of the rope, dropping the ladder so that it lands hard on the ground. And the idea is that it'll jostle the patient so their spine will come back into alignment. This is a very, very bad idea, and you should not do it, not ever, not now, no matter how bored you get in quarantine. Do not. Do not do this thing. Very bad. I mean, if you want to get naked and tie each other to ladders, great. Just don't drop each other. You will hurt somebody. On to the Spoon of Diocles. Folks, this is one of my favorites. And... Alas, the object I'm showing you right now is a modern forgery, but I'm showing it to you anyway because until we find an actual one of these, this is the closest thing I can show you because it survives only in descriptions. One of them's in Kelsus. Uh, Kelsus is our clearest and best, but they get mentioned elsewhere too. So this was invented uh, by Diocles of Charistus. He is a very early physician. He predates... Um, the Hippocratic Corpus and historical Hippocrates as well. He's fifth century, early-ish fifth century, and he was one of these doctors who was so good he was headhunted from one city to another city-state. Uh, great career. Despite thinking, and we know this from Serranus, he thought that inside the uterus are practice nipples so the fetus can like get used to the concept of breastfeeding before they're born. <laughs> And Serana says quite rightly, like, Diocles is full of shit. There are no nipples inside the uterus. Bless you, Serranus. You're, you're a treasure and a delight, and I'm glad you exist. Okay, so on to the spoon of Diocles. Now, here I'm going to use more of my poor art skills to draw you a picture of the problem. The problem is the profile of arrows used in combat. Um, I'm going to draw the silhouette out here in the margin. So here's the pointy end of the arrow. Oh, that's not great. Oh, that's, that's bad, but you get the idea. Um, unlike a bodkin type arrow, which just kind of 
swells smoothly from one end to the other and is made to be easily pulled out of something you're, say, hunting for dinner. This arrow is done to do the maximum amount of damage pulling it out after it's gone in. The idea is that if somebody tries to extract this arrow from an enemy combatant, they're not just going to pull out the arrowhead because your flesh doesn't stay open behind an arrow. The arrow buries itself and it's sliding between layers of muscle tissue and nerves and tendons and so on. And it shifts a little bit while it's in there because once you're shot, once you move around, your muscles are going to slip and slide over the pointy barbs so that when you grab this and immediately pull it out of the body, if you don't know what the you're doing and you mess it up, you're not just going to pull out the arrowhead, you're going to pull out the poor person's biceps. So uh, first and foremost, if somebody gets shot with an arrow, don't just pull it out. You will hurt someone. It's incompetent and unacceptable standard of care. But what to do instead, you may ask? Well, here is where the spoon of Diocles comes in. This is meant to create a safe way to remove an arrow from a wound without damaging the flesh around it. So here I'm following Kelsus in my description. I'm going to use my red to give you a sense of, okay, so say here is the surface of the skin. And then I'm going to make the arrow golden because I'm fancy. Oh, such a bad arrowhead. We'll just, just like pretend the barbs are somewhat in the lines here. You see, this is why I'm not going to judge you for your medical illustrations. Okay. So just humor me by pretending that this is a decent picture of an arrowhead. God, oh, that's so bad. No, that made it worse. You take first your scalpel and then using uh, this, this purple line, you widen the wound tract here at the surface and then you dissect like so to free up the barbs of the arrow. So now you've widened the wound a little bit, but you've also made the wound tract much wider at the bottom. And this is another thing that you have to deal with in arrow wounds, is that the arrow isn't sterile. If you're lucky, it's just a dirty, nasty arrow. If you're not lucky, this is an arrow somebody has dipped in something super icky or poisonous, or both, or both. Uh, poison arrows are a thing that people are using in ancient warfare. So. The arrowhead buries itself, taking all of its pathogens with it, and it drives it into the very bottom of the wound tract, right here, which is now going to end up covered when you remove the arrowhead. So it's not just getting the arrowhead out, but you have to clean the wound really, really well. Puncture wounds are a problem because puncture wounds hold bacteria and create great opportunities for um, silent and deadly infections. And we haven't even scratched the surface of what a rusty arrowhead could do to. A lot of these are steel iron alloy arrowheads. Iron inter alia stores tet tetanus bacteria, um, otherwise known as lockjaw, because it makes all of your muscles seize up and you die horribly. It's really bad. Um, there are no vaccines in the ancient world, so uh, yeah. My point is, when this is done, you want to clean it really well, and Kelsus tells you to because he's a competent professional. Okay. So once you have dissected around this wound, you've cleared both of the backward facing spikes, your arrow barbs. Um, then you take the spoon of Diocles and then you slide it, let me switch back to my purple, downwards into the wound tract, a little bit below where the arrowhead is. There's a hole there in the bottom of the spoon. You get that around the point of the arrow and that secures the arrow flat. Uh, here I'll draw the uh, wooden part of the arrow in like blue. 
So you're going to leave part of the arrow shaft. Oh, that was bad. Let's do like, yeah, here we go. You're going to leave part of the arrow shaft in so you can grip this really well. You're going to lay the arrowhead flat against the spoon. Um, and uh, this really should be a wider spoon, wide enough to uh, we'll just put it here. Encapsulate the barb like that. So once you've got all this set, you pull the spoon out by these back grips. So you use that as your handle, you hold the arrow flat against, and then you carefully pull it out, making sure that the barb doesn't catch on the flesh. Then you clean the wound very carefully, you leave it open and draining, um, probably with a, a bronze pipe drain. And then you're going to have a much better outcome than you would have if you'd pulled out your friend's bicep. And life is too short to live it without a bicep. So if you remember nothing else from this, uh, if your friend gets shot with an arrow, don't just pull it out like you're in a fantasy movie or something. That's irresponsible and you will hurt people. Now we're going to do pelvic surgery. So private parts, nether regions, that's all coming up. If you don't want to see it, look somewhere else. This brings me to the lithotomy. We've talked about this one already, but let's do it again. Uh, partly because I realized I might have made a mistake in how I described this when I was discussing the cutting for the stone procedure in the Hippocratic corpus. So let's uh, go through this again, shall we? <clears throat> this time a bit more correctly. The lithotomy is um, a fancy word for this procedure. It's from the Greek word for stone and the Greek word for the cut. So it's the cutting for the stone procedure. The stone we're talking about is in the upper left hand corner there. These are bladder stones. Uh, bladder stones are made up from crystals that form often in the kidneys and then travel down the ureters into the bladder where they can coalesce into bigger stones and eventually block off the urine. You remember the stone, we've talked about the stone. Okay, so let's have a look at Kelsus's procedure for dealing with this problem. This was the current state-of-the-art procedure into the 16th century which is the period from which this drawing comes. So this is from a 16th century urology manual. Okay, for the two days before the procedure, the patient has to fast, and this is most properly done on a younger patient under the age of 14, uh, because as the prostate enlarges, it becomes more difficult to get to the access point here. You, once you've cleared out the bowels, it's as clean as it's going to get, uh, you put the patient into the lithotomy position. I'll show you a picture of that on the next slide. And then you go in rectally with your hand and you, here, I'll draw on this just to add to the horror. So you or your assistant goes in manually here and puts pressure in this direction. Um, pushing steadily down until they feel the stone and then they manipulate the stone into the neck of the bladder. This region here, uh, there's the neck. Another assistant puts their hands here pushing down on the bladder and this is properly done with the full bladder. Now in later versions you would do this with a urinary catheter in place which is what's going on here as the assistant is holding the catheter to keep the penis out of the way. In antiquity, they didn't use the catheter. You wanted to keep urinary pressure behind the stone. All right, so once you've gotten the stone pressed as firmly down into, use orange for the stone, this area as possible. So this is what you're going for here. Then the surgeon goes in through the perineum. So the perineum, um, you may be more familiar with it as the taint. This is the bit of skin between the base of the penis and the anus. Um, our surgeon surgery manual has helpfully drawn for you the location. Kelsus refers to this as two fingers above the anus. 
which I guess two fingers above the anus seems about right. You go in here with a sharp knife, as our surgeon is doing, and you make a cut into the neck of the bladder. So this is where the urethra joins into the bladder, where it's a little bit narrower, but still not so narrow that you're gonna sever the urethra, which is one of the many things that can go wrong here. At this point, we go for the lithotomy scoop, which is a specialized instrument that survives uh, in fairly rough shape, but we have enough we've been able to make a reconstruction. I'll switch back to my red here for our lithotomy scoop. This is the broken end. This segment is whole. Some of them are double-headed, which is why the reconstruction is double heads. It has a pointy tip here. And then the inside of the scoop here has little dimples on it for traction. Um, sometimes it's ridges which informs the reconstruction here, and this is double-headed so that you can uh, flip it. I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but nonetheless, we find them like this, so this is probably useful in some way. Okay, you go in through the incision with this tool, and you're careful um, to keep your hand positioned in such a way that you avoid injuring the urethra. So you keep, as the surgeon is, one finger up here. This would be positioned along this axis of the lithotomy scoop. You introduce that into the neck of the bladder and then you scoop out the stones through this incision that you've made in the perineum. So the stones are all coming out this way, not uh, rectally as I originally thought I misread the Latin. Good thing I went back. Okay. When you've got as much gone as possible, then you um, remove the instruments, you let this area close up on its own, you pray to God it doesn't form a fistula. Um, part of how you encourage it to heal back together is you apply pressure and then you bandage it carefully and wash it. Uh, you keep the patient fasting for another couple of days to avoid bowel movements passing through the region. Um, bowel movements are going to disturb the tissue and cause it to rub against itself and not heal up together. If all goes well, nobody gets infected, nobody's urethra is cut, and the stones are out. But it's a, a grueling procedure, and the faster you go, the more margin for error there is here. And this, you know, as we mentioned earlier, is a procedure that's being done on young children. So ugh. let us see what our medical illustrators have made of this. We're back to that medieval manuscript of Kelsey's again, because I just, I love it. I love it so much. Um, I have so many questions, uh, mostly why is the patient smiling? Why is everyone smiling? It's very creepy, but also, I don't think they're really showing the procedure well. Like we've got legs in the air, the, the position is about right, but all we see is a guy with a, a knife that is far, far too large. Although I can see why he's wearing red. It would really help cover up the ensuing mess. The position that our patient is in is called the lithotomy position. It's first described by Kelsus and illustrated elsewhere. Uh, here it is in the 1700s. Uh, this illustration up here, where the surgeon with his tool belt is up in front. The assistants are holding the patient back. Um, the surgeon here also has his hand on the catheter, which is an interesting choice and they're going in. The patient here does look appropriately dismayed, and they're certainly trying to hold him down. Also notice there's a box of sand here at the bottom. It's nice, they're thinking about hygiene, sort of. Cool. Um, you may have heard of the lithotomy position, even if you haven't heard of lithotomy. That's because this position was used to describe the position that laboring women are put in and in the pushing stage of labor. Um, this is that slightly raised knees up you know, position that's 
familiar to you also if you've ever had a pelvic exam. It's, that's the position. It's a position that's really good for practitioners of gynecology, but again, not, not the best for all delivering situations. Not the worst, not the best. Don't know if there is a good one. Well, I mean, there, there are best practices. I shouldn't be salty about that. On to hernias. A hernia happens when the fibrous tissue that line your abdominal cavity uh, develop a thin spot that then breaks and allows your bowel to slip in through the opening. Uh, these can happen with other organs too. In your diaphragm, a hiatal hernia happens when your stomach moves a little bit up above the axis of the diaphragm. Um, here we're looking at the most common kind of hernia that would pop up and cause trouble in the ancient world. That is um, an inguinal hernia. So that's a hernia at the very bottom of the abdominal cavity. So the fascia are these fibrous membranes that hold the abdominal organs into place. Within the fascia, the bowel tissue is loose, which is usually a good thing because a lot of material has to move through it. It needs to be able to bend and flex, but it becomes a problem when the bowel slips through one of these holes because the fascia are tough and the area around the tear creates a choke point so that if your intestine slips through and it isn't immediately pushed back in, it can cut off the blood supply, cause that section of bowel to die, and then you have a necrotic bowel, which is very, very bad for you. In rare instances, a hernia can pop all the way to the outside of the body, which is what's going on in the picture on the lower right-hand side. This kind of hernia, an inguinal hernia, is much more common in men than in women because um, the way that testicles get to the outside of the body, and this, this happens in the later stages of fetal development or um, when you're just a little baby, your testicles have to move from the abdominal cavity and descend into the scrotum. And they do so through a hole that's made in the bottom floor of the abdominal fascia. When that happens, this leaves a weak spot. And this weak spot can widen over time. And because gravity pulls downwards and there aren't a lot of structures above this, um, the intestines slip down and out through the hole and boom, inguinal hernia. These are fairly common and pretty unpleasant. Uh, people still get them a lot. Small ones, you can put a, a binder on to hold them into place, and that's still a go-to for dealing with a small hernia. As long as you poke them back in, you're usually okay. It's not a great situation, but they're hard to repair because the tissue you're repairing is fibrous and the holes that you make when sewing the repair in can make more injuries in other parts of the tissue. So repairing these areas before the age of um, mesh and modern surgery gets a bit tricky, which is not to say it's impossible, it's just tricky. So here's what this looks like in calcium. This time our medieval manuscript gives us a great illustration, so we're just going to go with this one. The patient has been put on a plank or a bed, which has been elevated with the foot up and the head down. This is using gravity to our advantage. This encourages the intestine to slip back into place. And once it's down, then when you go in to repair the hole in the fascia, you can do so without any gravitational pressure on the area. And then if you keep the patient in this downward facing position, or at least slightly de-elevated, reverse elevated, um, feet up, then you can keep pressure off it long enough for scar tissue to heal firmly and for a repair to take. Um, still risky because it's still abdominal surgery and you can still contaminate the abdominal cavity. Um, it seems more typical to have just put the patient upside down, applied a truss, um, 
so like to wrap tightly with linen or leather or something firm that's going to hold uh, that hole closed and keep the intestine from slipping through that's less invasive it's more safe but then you have to wear a corset for the rest of your life to keep your intestines where they belong um, pick your poison i guess guys we're about to look at a dental abscess in a live patient it's going to be pretty gnarly um I put down your snack for a minute, uh, steal yourself. It's going to be a bit gross. All right, good. Ready? Gut check. Okay. Steady on, folks. Welcome to Infected Tonsils. This is... Uh, a problem that we don't think about a lot uh, we still do have effective surgeries for this but in the ancient world again pre-antibiotics chronic infections that set themselves up in the tonsils could be incredibly painful and eventually dangerous um, this is because tonsils are made to catch particulate matter and pathogens in your throat before they go down into your lungs and to your stomach. So this is meant to be a defense mechanism and they work well, except they can form pockets as they catch material and that material burrows in. Um, they can form pockets of abscess like any other tissue, but it's mucous membrane, so it forms abscesses pretty easily. And then over time, this means that your tonsils themselves become these large bags of active infected pus that are just sitting at the top of your throat, dripping down into your breathing air, into your breathing passages and into your stomach, and also just giving you horrible breath and hurting like a, and making it difficult to swallow. And very bad tonsils are very unpleasant. However, removing tonsils is dangerous because you're operating on an airway if you cut into this tissue which bleeds very freely and it's in a mucous membrane so it's also very wet and you're going to cause salivation reactions as you're cutting if you do this wrong your patient is going to aspirate their own blood and drown in their own bleeding ex tonsils you do not want this to happen. That is very, very bad. And it did happen to people in the ancient world. This was a pretty risky surgery. Today, we manage this risk of bleeding and aspiration by using laser cautery. Um, you can also do this with a blade. You just have to be very careful to uh, aspirate out the blood. Uh, we now have ways to get an airway so that we can intubate in a real emergency. But essentially, we've found ways to make it safer including antibiotics for romans they had to do it another way now cautery is part of what they're doing and likely was used with this device we're about to look at so here where i'm drawing a little red star very bad red star is the ancient find it's in great shape yeah and we know that this is specifically a tonsil forcep because of the shape of the grippers um, they're canted sideways so these aren't like a continuous plane like pliers but rather there's this thin blade of teeth that interlock and create a scooping surface on the other side uh, this particular pair is a little bit different than the reproduction pair the reproduction is based on a different find that looks less pretty this one has locking rings so you can leave it in place for a while that's a feature the ancient one is fantastic uh, the modern one you have to use your hand to hold it closed but they both share this system of recessed gripper teeth on a very long edge so either heated for cautery or just straight you would take these and then clamp them against the tonsil right where the tonsil meets the the flesh of the throat and you'd use that to cut off circulation and you'd hold it there for a bit until the blood flow stopped and the body began the clotting procedure so you're essentially cutting off circulation letting the tonsil die 
And then at that point, you go in with your scalpel. And then this is why there's that recessed pocket on the pliers. Or they're not really pliers, they're forceps. So the forceps grip, lock. And then you go in and you cut as close to the blade as possible to remove the infected tonsils. But the forceps are still gripping that flap of tissue. So you're not causing any bleeding when you do this. And then you have to hold there long enough for the bleeding to stop. And then when you let go, you have to hope that you waited long enough and that the bleeding is calmed down and you're good. And then you move on to the next tonsil. It's pretty clever. And it's a procedure that's attested in ancient sources. It seems to have gone off well most of the time. And this is one of the situations in which you can care for the wound pretty well once you've stopped the bleeding, um, which would be pretty fast if you're applying cautery. Another thing you can do is not heat the forceps themselves, but after you've cut off the tissue, you can go back in with the cautery iron, apply that, and then let go. Once you're done, um, drinking hydromel, so that honey water solution um, with a little bit of salt, salt gargles, and still what we tell people to do for their throat when it's healing from surgery is to gargle with salt water because it works. It's very effective. So if you don't bleed into your airway, this is survivable. You just have to be very, very careful about how you cut off tonsils. Please don't DIY tonsils surgery either. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. This is what happens if you don't treat a dental abscess. And uh, yeah, it's gnarly, but it's also necessary to talk about this because we're in a country where we don't guarantee access to affordable dental services. It's actually kind of weird that we don't put dental care in with health care because dental care is important to life. It's not an extra. It's not an elective thing. Your dental health can lead to disfigurement and death if an infection goes unchecked in your teeth. And it's kind of ludicrous that we don't cover that. Um, a friend of the family had pus from an infected tooth and a dental abscess get into his bloodstream. This can sometimes happen. The, the pus can break off. It can make its way into your bloodstream. And it ended up lodging in his brain and creating this series of tumors that luckily they caught, diagnosed, and treated with antibiotics before it actually killed him. But he was an uninsured father of 10 in rural West Virginia, where access to health care is a real problem. So Part of why we're having this conversation is that we really need to have this conversation. Uh, dentistry isn't an extra. Dentistry, if you think healthcare is a human right, dentistry should be in there too because your teeth are in your body and your teeth can kill you. Also, brush your teeth. It's good for you. Uh, but brushing your teeth isn't the isn't a foolproof method to not get a dental abscess. It could happen to anyone. So a dental abscess is just like any other abscess, right? It's a pocket of pus that forms in your body. In this case, though, it forms in or near your teeth structures. The ones that we're looking at here are very advanced. This is what happens if you don't treat one. Eventually, it'll eat its way to drain, like the other abscesses we've been looking at, yeah. Abscesses try to find the closest route for drainage, and that's a feature, not a bug. That's because if it just stays in your body and builds up pressure and builds up pressure, it will cause even worse anatomical damage, including, you know, abscess or embolus, which is bad. It's very, very bad. Um, those emboluses can also go to your heart. Um, your liver, it, it can kill you in a number of unpleasant and preventable ways. Dental access saves lives, guys. It's, it's super important. At any rate, right. 
what we're looking at on the top image is a very advanced abscess. By this point, you would have been in excruciating pain for months. If you have an abscess, you know you have an abscess. Even if you don't progress to a state where you have facial swelling, you'll feel pain, uh, especially if it is impinging on your teeth nerves. Your, your dental nerves are very, very sensitive, as anyone who's ever had a dental procedure knows. And as that nerve begins to die, as it does as decay progresses through the tooth, and as infection starts to eat away at the structures surrounding the nerve, it causes exquisite excruciating pain until the nerve dies. But the infection can continue to grow after that point and cause swelling. Um, often you'll see it in your cheek, but it can be internal too. Uh, this patient on their soft palate, you can see here, elsewhere too, there, there are a few areas of concern, but that's the most obvious one. Um, here, an abscess on the uh, lingual side of one of the upper molars is eating its way through and trying to, to drain into the mouth, which can happen. Um, when these infections are active, and draining uh, doesn't necessarily mean they'll resolve. These can keep draining for years and years into your mouth, down your throat. Um, this is another complication of radium poisoning. Don't eat radium. I shouldn't have to tell you this, but don't eat radium. People have done it. It went very poorly. Okay. If the abscess is on the buccal side, so the, the cheek side of your teeth, then it will eat its way out to the closest soft outlet, which is going to be your cheek. And that's what's happened with this patient here in the green. Um, this is their chin. Their mouth is up here. That's the line of the jaw, ear, and this horrifying space is where the pus is draining out and the infected matter, including the, the dead tissue, is coming through the skin of the face. Um, the picture below shows after it's been cleaned when they're in the process of reconstructive surgery. Uh, this person did get medical attention. Uh, both of these people are fine, thank God. Uh, but this is why dental, dental health is really serious. Um, however, Dental health in the ancient Mediterranean was, on average, demographically speaking, better than modern dental health because they don't have access to refined cane sugar in amounts that have the ability to give them accelerated dental decay. They did have access to sugar cane sugar. It was a rare and expensive trade good from India that was very difficult to get a hold of and so rare that it was used in tiny amounts medicinally. Sometimes fancy people would use it as a, a gritty substance in their toothpaste. <laughs> they might have been in trouble, but that's like the Emperor Nero. You, know, you, you have to be a super out of control emperor to use sugarcane toothpaste. <sighs> this looks a lot better in skeletons, doesn't it? Here we are looking at some skeletons with tooth problems. Now I said that dental health on average is a lot better in the ancient Mediterranean, but this doesn't mean that dental abscesses and decay didn't happen. They absolutely did. They didn't have refined cane sugar, but they had honey. Um, they ate a high carbohydrate load diet with bread that had a lot of grit in it, which can wear down the enamel on your teeth and open the surfaces for decay and cavities which can progress to create uh, toothache, dental abscess. All of this they were aware of. They, they didn't quite get that it was decay that made your teeth hurt. Uh, they thought that these theoretical worms were in your teeth and were eating through your teeth. So when you're looking for dental information in ancient texts, one of the things you should look for is teeth worms. Uh, not actual worms, just, you know, theoretical teeth worms, because they didn't quite get how dental decay worked, because again, germ theory, yes, it's important. 
So here we are looking at a couple of ancient skulls showing evidence of advanced dental and periodontal disease. Periodontal diseases, disease processes in the, the gums and the underlying bones, so the soft tissue of the mouth. The one on the top is a really extreme example. Here, looking at the hard palate, you can see the uh, parotic hyperostosis, yeah, the, the honeycombing of the bones, um, the really friable edges, the, the broken look to the front edge of the mandible. This person had an extensive and advanced infection in the, the tooth roots of the front incisors. Moving on into there might be a little involvement of the canine there, although I think that's just a hole that the pus is dug from the root of the incisor back up into the hard palate. This likely would have been an active infection at the time of death. Uh, you, can, you can see that the bone is very sharp. There isn't a lot of healing. This infection didn't resolve, and it could have been the cause of death. So that's actually sadder than the last slide if you think about it long enough. Um, next, on the other patient, we have advanced periodontal disease on this molar. You can see here how the bone is receded from the tooth root. Um, the gum would have been receded as well, and there's a lot of parotic hyperostosis in the bone tissue around that tooth, so that's an actively infected tooth. Now, the way ancient people would intervene to prevent this from progressing to an open face abscess was by removing the tooth itself. When you remove the tooth, you create a drainage route for the infection, and you can then swish and clean it out. And if you catch it early enough, that can arrest the infection and resolve it. And that's still essentially what we do. A root canal lets us drill into the tooth relieve the pressure, remove the infected matter, but leave uh, the dead hulk of the tooth in place. Uh, we fill it back up with um, different substances to stabilize the tooth. Uh, sometimes we put a crown on it. So it's just about keeping the function of chewing on that tooth, but the tooth itself is dead. The nerve is gone. Uh, the space has been filled with an artificial filling. In fact, this one right here, yeah. It's the dead hulk of my front incisor right there. I'm really glad it didn't turn into that guy. I shouldn't gloat, but I am really glad. This was a, a recorder playing injury. I uh, smacked myself in the face with my musical instrument and uh, severed my nerve root and it got infected. I think that's the dorkiest injury in the history of ever, but... What can you do? So what did we do to remove these teeth, you may ask? Well, you're looking at them right there are the dental pliers. You may remember those from the slide in which we discuss it. Removing teeth. I'm not going to unpick this too much, but you can see how this would be a pretty easy process in a tooth um, like this and right here. It's already loose. It's not well connected to the bone. It's amazing it's still in there for us to look at it at all. So pulling it out is gonna be easier. And even removing just one tooth involved in an infection would be enough to clear the drainage and hopefully arrest the disease process, at least for the time being. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's enough tooth horror. Let's move on to other horror.